afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to our first event of the semester. It is really, truly a privilege to welcome Professor Yogendra Yadav here to Berkeley. And when we knew he was coming, we told him, you know, this is really not a good time because it's, you know, the semester hasn't started and no one is really around. And well, this just shows the, you know, how much we all are interested in hearing Professor Yadav's uh, talk today. So I'm so glad he could come. Uh, Professor Pranav Bardhan will be leading the discussion with him and will introduce Professor Yadav. <coughs> so I would like to welcome Professor Pranav Bardhan. He's a professor emeritus in economics here at Berkeley. He'll introduce Professor Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm not going to be stand between me and uh, between Yogendra Yadav and, and, and you. Just one minute introduction. He doesn't need an introduction to this audience. Um, he's a rare uh, species that a professor of politics entering politics, <laughs> particularly at a time when the quality of pol our politicians <laughs> leave much to be desired. <coughs> uh, the other second point that I wanted to uh, mention that uh, many of you probably already know that he used to be uh, one of India's uh, most well-known sophologists, those who do election uh, studies. There was a time when he was in charge of the national election studies uh, that uh, all the TV stations were after him to find out what's going on, what's the prediction, what's the prognosis. And every, every night you will see uh, Yogan in, the, in, in TV. So that's how, how famous he is. Now, of course, he's in, he's in politics and activism. And that's a different role. We welcome him in that role. But before that, let me welcome him to Berkeley again. Yogi. Thank you. Uh, thanks to Institute of South Asia Studies uh, for having me at this time, which they said and I realized was the one of the most inopportune moments to be shared. Uh, thank you all for turning up. Uh, special thanks to those who have taken the trouble of standing here. I'm sorry, I really feel bad about this. Uh, to Pradeep, who's chosen to stand, <laughs> although he has a chair reserved for him here. Uh, uh, thank you. Pranavda for the kind words. Any word coming from you uh, carries such a special value for uh, me and I'm sure for anyone here. You said this was a, this was because of my presence that so many people turned up. I don't think that's the case. I think it is because many of us shared an anxiety, which is very, very deep anxiety right now. Uh, so it's in a sense a testimony to that uh, difficult times that we live in and the difficult situation that we all face. And that is what I seek to address today, without much formalities, without much preface. Uh, and yes, I speak as a political activist. Uh, so thank you for reminding me of my previous birth. But that's strictly my previous birth. I often wonder what I was doing those years. <laughs> and I really wonder why people get into this silly thing of election forecasting. <laughs> when you know the result anyway in 72 hours. You know, so, uh, so forgive me for all that. Uh, I speak as a political worker who is uh, very worried, anxious about what's happening in my country, but who perhaps is also conscious of the duty to be objective in one's assessment of what's happening and who has still not given up hopes that something can still be done. So that's what I propose to do today. 23rd of May this year was a day of shock, disbelief, anger, dismay for many of us in this room. Uh, this may not be every one of us. I do assume that some of us uh, may have seen that hope day as a day of hope. It's democracy. Many of us may have seen as a day uh, where positive things happen. But I do know, and since I happen to belong to that other community, which saw that day with deep 
this may be. And that is what I wish to speak to. I must uh, confess that my own reaction was not that of uh, disbelief. Uh, I've been warning my friends for more than a month before that, that this was coming. I had underestimated the extent of it, but that BJP and NDA was well on its way to coming back to power. It was quite evident to anyone who was walking on the streets. Uh, in a sense, I've been writing about it for quite some time. When Mr. Modi won his second victory in 2007 in Gujarat, I wrote an article uh, that was in Hindi saying, Gujarat se chitthi aai. A letter has come from Gujarat. And I said that, that this letter, every Indian must read, because this contains some very important messages. Uh, two years ago, I wrote a long article uh, that some of you may wish to go back now. Uh, it's slightly dated, but not dated in any fundamental respect. It came out in the seminar, was called, mm -hmm. What is to be done? I guess it was year 2017, and I wanted to remember 1917. So mm -hmm. it was called, What is to be done? But basically, it said, how do you deal with the phenomena that Mr. Modi represents? It also had some section on what is not to be done. And if you go back now, you would see that the opposition did exactly what people like me were saying, what is not to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are in that state. Um, and I've been speaking in other places about uh, how to defend India's swadharma. So on YouTube, you would have a lecture saying about defending India's swadharma. I'll not repeat some of those things here. Uh, the way I propose to go about uh, this uh, afternoon is first to say how to react to this verdict, then to say what challenges do we face today? I won't go into the details of the causal trajectory that led to those challenges. That's another lecture, different analysis altogether. And I'll jump straight away into how this challenge should not be responded to, what is not to be done, and finally come to what needs to be done, what can still be done. So uh, the one transition from days of being a political scientist to the days of political activist is that this last question is uh, something that uh, interests me more than uh, anything else. <clears throat> I've been asked to be louder, so I'll now remember my <laughs> teaching days <laughs> in Punjab University, Chandigarh, uh, where you had to throw your voice. Uh, <clears throat> And I'd assured Punita that I can do it. Uh, so I would like to spend more time and energy on what should not be done and what should be done than on the analysis of what has happened and why. But you obviously cannot begin without doing so. So let me begin by saying how we should not respond to the 2019 verdict. Number one, don't live in denial. Mr. Modi won because people of India by and large voted for him. This may be a harsh fact, but let's begin by accepting it. It's not EVM. It is not EC. I've had to write two or three articles on the EVM business. Won't bore you with all the details. Please go and read it. All I've said again and again is, yes, EVMs are manipulable. Yes, Mr. Modi and Shah may have no compunctions. They have never suffered from one. <laughs> that the EC is pliable. But from these three, please do not conclude that elections have actually been rigged through EVMs. We have had no definite evidence so far. And in any case, if you were on the street, if you were speaking to ordinary people, it should not come as any surprise. <coughs> Ordinary people voted for Mr. Modi more than they did in 2014, and that's why he is won. So let's settle the debate here. Let's not waste too much time on this. That's living in denial. Point two. Let's not <coughs> put the entire burden on things which are true, 
but which are which is not the operational truth for me what is true the bjp commands an election machine which india has never witnessed before the organizational propaganda machine and the organizational machine down to the booth level is the kind of machine no indian political party has ever come up with for those of you somewhat familiar with the indian examination systems and those of me who would still remember how we used to do our high school examinations in my days doing high school examinations and we did reasonably well in those days meant and pradeep would recall reading your textbook carefully and in the evening say you know i've done my textbook i know the things i'll go and sit for examination and what happens today when quota coaching has come you know you have four questions of half mark each and in order to prepare that here are 1000 questions that you have to sort before you go into the classroom <laughs> and you would get map from chapter 6 and here are 50 maps that you must practice before you go in the difference between the way bjp approaches elections and the way every other party approaches election is of this kind every other party is in the previous age of examinations bjp is in a different mode altogether so yes election machine mattered but is going to stay there's nothing you and i can do about it money and media yes bjp spent the amount of money that no one has any idea someone has floated the figure of 27000 crore rupees uh, i'm not entirely sure what the basis of that is i still believe that may be an underestimate uh, we're dealing with unimaginable amount of money that is being thrown when congress says we have been out competed on money you know something is very serious <laughs> you know so that was the case congressmen were complaining through the elections we don't have enough money to match BJP. so yes money played a role uh, yes media the less said the better this is one of the darkest hours of indian media i was old enough to remember emergency and the newspapers all the lovely things they used to write about emergency i remember that but I knew, even as a 13-year-old child, I knew that these newspapers were censored. Mm -hmm. I knew what censorship meant. This is not what an ordinary news, watching, news television watching public thinks in India today. So the degree of control of the media is to be seen to be believed. Uh, but I won't bore you with all the details. All of us know that this is here to stay. So this is true. All these are correct explanations. EVM is not, but these are correct explanations for why BJP had the structural advantage. The only reason why I'm not spending much time on it is all this is here to stay. There's nothing you and I can do in the next three, four years to change it. Uh, communal hatred and jingoism, yes, was thrown in considerable amount uh, in a very selective manner, carefully modulated, the manner in which the Prime Minister and people around him can sort of you know, taper the flame, ignite it exactly where it's needed, and then just put it on sim when they need it, is astonishing stuff. Uh, yes, national security after Balakot, as uh, Pranodha has written somewhere, that became uh, the operational, that, that became the moment when election turned and uh, things turned in favor of BJP. All this is true. This is not sufficient. All these explanations are correct explanations for why Mr. Modi won 2019. They are not sufficient. They do not give me an operational hand. They are not sufficient because any other government which faced a Pulwama and then went for Balakot would have been asked very searching questions. Any other government would have been asked, why did we lose 40 security personnel when you knew this was going to happen? You had alert, you had warning. Government would have been questioned. In BJP's regime, everyone who asked this question was questioned. Why does that happen so? You can say because of their manipulation, no, I think we're dealing with something much deeper there. Something of a deeper order is taking place there. 
the government's performance, I think it's only fair to say that it was one of the mediocre governments. It wasn't the worst government in India in the last 70 years, but by records of governments, it was a mediocre government. A mediocre government which gets another mandate. Why does that happen, sir? To my mind, we need to face a deeper truth, which is that the BJP as a party enjoyed, the Prime Minister enjoyed personal popularity. The government was on balance approved despite mediocre performance and that there was a widespread ideological support for it, which made it possible for the government to commit some of the blunders that it did and yet emerge out of it. No government, I mean, I, I, I Pranodha would know much better, we have other economists in the room, how many governments in the world can survive a demonetization disaster? <laughs> I mean, this is this should be a textbook case of how a government can commit such a big blunder and win the next election. So we looked at that. So the explanation doesn't lie in the realm of governance, doesn't lie in the realm of economy. The explanation primarily lies in the realm of political consciousness and how it was managed, manipulated, etc. So we must, number one, accept, so in terms of fundamentals, which are operational from my point of view, one, on balance, the government looked like the better alternative, primarily because the opposition looked like a joke, and indeed it was a joke through the election. So basically, if you were to think of a metaphor, you know, elections are like snapshots, which are taken at one point of time in the race. Like you have that uh, snapshot at 100 meter race, it you know, gives you the exact position of all the athletes. So in thinking in terms of metaphors and images, what happened was this. By the end of his fourth year, some disillusionment had set in with Mr. Modi. People were beginning to be uneasy with what was happening. They turned around, looked for an alternative. They saw Rahul. They quickly shifted their gaze back, anxiously rediscovered some virtue in Mr. Modi. And when they were trying to do so, that is the moment when the photographers clicked. This is really what happened. It is not that there was no disenchantment with him. It is not that everything that he did was approved of. It is not that those who have voted for him do not know that he's a habitual liar. They do. I've spoken to people. You know, one of the advantages of being in public life is that people sort of present, you know, your, your case study presents it itself to you. <laughs> so this person walks to me and says, uh, you know, I really love what you see on television. Don't get me wrong, I'm a Modi admirer. I said, why don't you sit down? So he sat down. <laughs> I said, both are They were both Modi ji ko do. I said, all right, why don't you sit down? I then said, वैसे ये बताओ, Modi ji सच बोलते हैं क्या? नहीं वो तो नहीं So this man who is saying I'm going to vote for Mr. Modi was candid enough to say, yes, I know he lies. So people knew that he lies. People knew that he suffers from arrogance. People knew that some of his decisions are a disaster. They know that he, the, some of the things he announces are bombastic without substance. But when they looked at the opposition, there was simply no alternative. Congress party had neither a message nor a message. <coughs> the grand alliance of SPBSP, in their public meetings, they went and said, we have an alliance of Yadavs and Muslims. We will win. I mean, not even a pretense of offering a new dream to UP. Not even a pretense of saying we'll do A, B, C in governance. They, from the stage they announced, we are three caste, we shall win. This is the alternative they had. So, just to summarize this bit, Mr. Modi won because uh, he was seen to be a, an alternative an alternative that's better than others in a climate which was ideologically conducive to it. 
those are the things which we can do something about and therefore that's what I will talk about. What is the impact of this election? Now that we've done something about the intent of the voters, what would be the impact? I've spoken about it, I've written about it. I will not go into too many details of it, but just to mention the fact that to my mind, and this may look like an overstatement, but I, I think it's technically correct to say that we are witnessing the dismantling of the Indian Republic. Uh, in the last few months, we are beginning to see that. And uh, the three pillars of the Indian Republic, very crudely speaking, and I'm not speaking of India of last 5,000 years, about which I am not the right person to speak. But India that began in 26 January 1950 had three pillars. I sometimes call it Swadharma, but that's a different lecture. Uh, democracy, diversity, <coughs> development. Democracy in terms of empowering the last person. Diversity not as a challenge, but diversity as a strength. And development, development for the last person. Uh, these are not the ideals India had fulfilled, the third one least of them. But these were still the ideals that India held up for itself. And what we are witnessing is a systematic dismantling of all the three. The challenge today is extraordinary. Not because the three pillars face a challenge for the first time. Democracy faced a challenge during emergency. Diversity faced a challenge during 1984, 2002, several times before that. But, and, and development is violated every day on the streets of India. But it is for the first time that all the three are being simultaneously attacked with a vigor which is unknown and unprecedented, sanctioned from the very top, and with a vision which is different. You see, there's a difference between adharma and vidharma. They are Sanskrit scholars, so I don't wish to I say whatever I say with trepidation. <laughs> but there is adharma and vidharma. Adharma is the Congress style. You keep saying, ah, these are great ideas and do exactly the opposite every day. <laughs> That's adharma. You can, most democracies, most societies live with a lot of adharma. That is the nature of dharma. You announce it, you fail to live it, but you still pay lip service. And lip service is a very serious service because you say moral acceptance of that. What we face today is Vidhar. The Prime Minister, after his victory, the first thing he says that very evening, no one dared to utter secularism in this election. This is my victory. Prime Minister's own words, not mine. So for the first time, from the highest constitutional offices, we are being told that some of the values inscribed in our constitutions are not the right values. What's wrong with opposing it? Why should we be secular? That's a different challenge. That's why the challenge today is unprecedented. And the challenge which can actually lead to uh, dismantling of uh, our republic. And what we have witnessed since the election has only confirmed it. I think we are beginning to see a new architecture which is coming into place. If you look at the amendments in the right to information, Basically, the constitutional, the, the, the legally sanctioned right to information has now been significantly diluted mm -hmm. in a way that the government can actually manipulate the information commission. We have a new amendment to the, 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 the UAPA, which basically entitles the government of India tomorrow to call me a terrorist. After that, the onus is on me to prove that I'm not a terrorist because I gave this lecture in University of Berkeley and, and, and uh, you know, vilified India so I can be called a terrorist. Then the onus is legally on me to prove that I'm actually not a terrorist. That has come into being. And if you look at what happened in Kashmir last week, the important thing is you can disagree, we can agree. I personally think it's a disastrous policy. I think it's one of the most unfortunate steps. 
I believe that India has gone back on its model of nation building. You know, 10 years ago, I wrote a book with Professor Juan Lenz and Delphine Stepan, basically saying that India inaugurated a new model of how to deal with diversities. Uh, that we have a state nation approach rather than a nation state approach because we respect diversities and we give them entrance from the front door. And within eight years, I think Mr. Modi must have read the book <laughs> and decided to teach us a lesson among others. So we, what we've done is really negated that hundred years of legacy of a new way of building, uh, of, of reconciling cultural and political boundaries. What is important about Kashmir is not only that BJP, decide, the government decides to do what the BJP has been saying for quite some time, but the fact that this was done without any consultation with anyone in JNK, without consultation with BJP's own allies who confirmed that they did not know that this bill was coming, was done at a time when JNK assembly is suspended. Even the minimal constitutional formality of referring it to the assembly, it's a mandatory formality, was dispensed with. That constitutional requirement of any amendment to 370 being referred to the constituent assembly of JNK was done away with. That the amendments were sort of sprung as surprise in the morning and were carried out within 36 hours, that not only 3370 was amended, but Jammu Kashmir as a state ceased to exist within 36 hours. And that a large number of regional parties of India actually backed it in Rajya Sabha and gave me BJP a majority. This gives us a sense of the times to come. We are beginning to look at a new architecture. And these are small pieces in that architecture. A new architecture where uh, we are walking towards an electoral authoritarianism of the kind that you have in Russia, of the kind you have in Turkey, you have in Hungary, which is to say elections do take place I'm absolutely confident that Mr. Modi is not going to suspend elections in the country. He doesn't need to. Elections will take place on time. Elections will be that plebiscitary moment through which the leader will reaffirm his popularity. In between two elections, it will resemble an authoritarian system. Every other democratic instrument will be suspended. Elections will take place. And during election, it will be the counting will be fair. Once again, I don't think EVM manipulation is going to happen. But everything other than counting will not be fair. We've already seen what election commission is up to. So this is the system we are walking towards. And on the other hand, we are walking towards a non-theocratic majoritarian state. India shall not become a Hindu theocratic state. There is no need to. For 99% ordinary citizen, the constitution of India is what the local policeman says it is. <laughs> you know, it's, the constitution exists only for that 1% who can catch a lawyer, go to some high court or supreme court, hope to get a bench who's willing to listen to them. For the rest of them, constitution has already changed. So it's a non-theocratic majoritarian state. The BJP is committed to citizenship's amendment bill. The sum and substance of that bill is, for the first time, independent Indian state is saying, no Muslims, please, thank you. If you come to India illegally, if you are not a Muslim, you are welcome. It's all right. But if you are a Muslim, sorry, out. So. For the first time, a two-nation theory is being brought in once again from the back door. So you would have amendments of this kind. And once you have these amendments, and once every police station in this country knows the difference between Anil and Anwar, then you don't need to make any constitutional amendments. 
for practical purposes, the citizenship status changes. Muslims are already being relegated to the status of a second-rate citizen informally. It may not be formalized, but it doesn't matter. So that's what we are going towards. That is the nature of the challenge that we face. So to summarize now, the nature of challenge that we face, the heart of the challenge is BJP's hegemony. Hegemony, as many students of political science would know here, is a term used by Marxist political theorist Gramsci, who says ruling class rules not only with danda, not only with coercion, but with ideological acceptance of those who are being ruled. So the BJP, the, the components of BJP's hegemony today are the following. BJP has electoral dominance. After 2014, it has expanded its electoral dominance. And I dare say, in the next three or four years, Bengal, Odisha, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana are going to be hunting grounds for the BJP. In Tamil Nadu, BJP may go for what is called, uh, in your uh, Bay Area language, uh, acquisition model. <laughs> so merger and acquisition model will be used in Tamil Nadu. One of the DMKs will put up a board of BJP tomorrow. You know, from next day onwards, it will become BJP. So that model may be used. Kerala may remain a different state. We don't know for how long. So BJP enjoys now definitely the kind of one party dominance that Congress had in the 80s. I don't compare it with 50s and 60s because it was a different kind of dominance. But of the 80s, definitely BJP has that today. That's one. Second, BJP has access to state power and BJP knows how to use it. I keep saying that only the CPM and the BJP know how to use state power. You know, in Congress times, uh, when, when Congress ruled, there was spaces available, not because Congress was liberal, but because it was anarchic and chaotic. <laughs> and chaos leaves room. So uh, BJP, like the CPM, these parties really know how to exercise power and how to take it to the lowest rung, how to recruit, how to change everything. So yes, state power, not only constitutional, used not only constitutionally, but also used in an extra constitutional way. So what the BJP is doing to the intelligence agencies of the country today, how much of that information is coming to the party now, we don't know. And how army is being infiltrated and being influenced, we do not know. We would never know the real story till about 20 years from now. So extraordinary use of state power, but also street power. State power mixed with street power is what gives it that kind of a coercive edge. Uh, in lynching, everywhere. Ten days ago, my colleagues, uh, five, seven days ago, my colleagues in uh, Raibareli were protesting against something of Uttar Pradesh government. It's not the police. The local BJP and ABBP workers came and announced that you cannot hold your protest here. Police did not arrive. They ensured that I mean, law and order was looked after by the BJP and ABBP. This is something we are likely to see more and more of. So st street power and state power combined into one. But finally, moral, cultural, and ideological legitimacy. This is the hardest pill to take. But the fact that BJP does enjoy this is something that needs to be accepted. Okay, so that's what we are dealing with, what is not to be done, and what is to be done. What is not to be done? I mean, I've written a long thing about roots of BJP's hegemony, but I'll not bore you with all that. As I said, there are too, just too many independent articles floating somewhere here. Uh, that uh, it is not surprising that our democracy has institutionally been weak for quite some time, that uh, our economic failures have exposed us to this kind of a emotional mobilization that uh, cultural mod the cultural logic of Indian modernity has uh, uh, has led to a certain kind of a 
cultural vacuum, uh, that uh, weakening of uh, political parties and instruments of political action over the last 20 years or so have created a ground for the BJP. And finally, what I call the death of modern Indian political thought. Suddenly in the 1970s, that 150 year old tradition of thinking suddenly died, which has created this space, an ideological vacuum. There are no, there is no fresh vocabulary you can draw upon. This is what has created the background, but as I said, all this is a separate academic article. I'm interested in what is not to be done. Point one, no denial, please. You know, spending energy on denial is a sheer wastage of time. Along with that, let me also add, living in regret is also a waste of time. I mean, so much of our conversation of groups like this, oh my God, what's happening? You know what happened in JNU yesterday? You know what happened there yesterday? Yeah, all this is true. It doesn't lend to positive energy. This is there. How much time can you spend on these things? Two important things about what is not to be done. No routine knee-jerk Modi bashing. Knee-jerk Modi bashing only contributes to Mr. Modi's success. This is exactly what the opposition has done. Every morning you get up and say, oh, Mr. Modi is going abroad. Ah, why is he abroad? Why is he not coming, you know, spending much time in India? If he had done the other way around, we would have said, why does he not go abroad? <laughs> Basically, we hate him. And we look for reasons. To, to bash him up. The trouble is public gets to know this. And as uh, my sister once upon a time told me, Are, tum logon ka to kaam hi unke <laughs> <laughs> So that's the problem. A routine Modi bashing of the kind that opposition has got into, oppositionism, doesn't help. It's counterproductive. A constructive, a, a constructive engagement could act because you know to the public's eyes, to the public's ears, it sounds silly, it sounds negative, uh, and that's what the opposition has done. So when they actually criticize Mr. Modi for things that he should have been criticized for, they look like being habitual critics and no more. So no habitual criticism. I heard something beautiful from uh, Turkey, you know, when Mr. Erdogan was defeated in the Istanbul election. Someone asked his chief, uh, the chief strategist of the anti-Erdogan camp, how did you manage to defeat him? He said, we, did, we just did two things. A, we ignored Erdogan completely. <laughs> and two, we decided to love those who love Erdogan. I saw, I thought it was a clever word. Then it began to sink in. I think he was saying something very deep. Love replace Erdogan with Modi, and you can see what's being suggested. Can you love those who love Mr. Modi? Most of us can't. It's hard. But that's why counter hegemony and politics is a very hard business. It is hard. But that's the way forward. So, no routine, knee jerk criticism. No opposition for the sake of opposition. And opposition unity is not going to get you anywhere. I can now claim that in 2017, in that article, I had said exactly this. A grand opposition unity will play into the hands of the BJP. Because this would be a replay of what Mrs. Gandhi said it did in 1971. What we forget is Mr. Mrs. Gandhi's extraordinary, by then, till then no leader had that kind of an extraordinary election success. That extraordinary electoral victory was in the face of an extraordinary coalition of the opposition. It was called Grand Alliance, Maha Gatabandhan in today's terms. Mrs. Gandhi said just one thing. Wo kehte hain, Indra hatao, main kehti hoon, bari bhi hatao. This one sentence demolished the opposition completely. This is practically what Mr. Modi has done. They talk about Modi, I'm talking about the nation. Finished. The entire opposition is there. Opposition unity 
in some ways is a useful formula, does work, has its mechanical effects and advantages, aggregation has advantages. But faced with a chemistry, faced with this kind of a strategy, opposition unity can actually play into BJP's hands. The whole world is against us because we stand for the nation. You know, uh, opposition unity also, a, for various reasons that which I had outlined then, the only point I wish to say is mere opposition unity will not achieve the purpose. And in today's situation, opposition unity can actually be counterproductive. Unity only of those parties which are discredited, which in the eyes of the people are the part of the problem, remind them of the old establishment, their unity is not going to work. All right, so what is to be done? I'll break what needs to be done in three parts. The immediate, the midterm, and the long term. And all three need to be done right now. It's not that the long term needs to be begun in the long run. All the three need to begin today, if we are serious about it. In the short term, there is an everyday battle of institutional autonomy and spaces. <laughs> if you are a JNU teacher today, you have no option but to combat this whole thing of dismantling <coughs> JNU right now, which is happening. If you are in a Supreme Court, you have to fight the battle of somehow maintaining autonomy of judiciary, somehow getting some of these illegal, unconstitutional things being <coughs> declared unconstitutional. If you are in a university campus, you fight for autonomy of universities. If you are in the media, you fight for some spaces of autonomous thinking in the media. But these are day-to-day -day battles. We have to fight these battles. That's not the way to take on BJP. That is, these are not serious counter-hegemonic moves. Elections, are elections going to be that? I'm not quite sure. I fear that increasingly elections will offer less and less of space for democratic opposition. Because elections will be, will be designed as that plebiscitary moment for the leader's popularity. I do not rule out uh, the BJP ruling a few elections once in a while. But by and large, because the level playing field is going to be extremely uneven now, the playing field is going to be anything but level. Chances of an opposition being able to put up a resistance to Mr. Modi and BJP during elections, to me, looks slimmer than before. But it's not a ground that can be abandoned altogether because uh, elections provide you with an opportunity to reach out to the people at a time when media is stifled at a time when public activities are under control, elections may still continue to be that little zero hour of democracy where you can actually stand up and speak. Uh, so, but that, that to my mind is the very limited function that elections will perform for some time to come. Medium term. I look at three arenas of struggle here. Farmers movement, movement against unemployment, and movement against corruption. It appears to me that farmers, <clears throat> drawing upon an old vocabulary which is no longer fashionable now, but the objective interests of the farmers happen to coincide with the interest of counter-hegemony in India today, which is to say farmers especially smaller farmers, sharecroppers, peasants, agriculture workers, because of the overall rural distress, and specifically distress in the farm sector, they are in a situation which is structurally pushing them to the brink. And if this section can be mobilized, but it cannot be mobilized with the old farmer union approach, because increasingly, the strength of farmers' movement will have to come from marginal farmers, from the small peasants. And how do you bring small peasants in the fold of farmers' movement? 
is a big challenge. But that is where I see one energy coming. We witnessed some sporadic episodes of that energy in the last two or three years, especially in the one year before election. And we also saw how much impact it can have. Even a few expressions of farmers' mobilization can shake up the regime. I calculated at one point, after that big farmers' demonstration that we had in Delhi, within six weeks, state governments and central governments put together announced 1,50,000 crore rupees of benefits to the farmers. Whether it was well spent money or poorly spent money, he would be able to tell. But when you can shake up, when farmers are on the street, things do begin to shake up. One. Second, if you ask me, the most important source of challenge to the regime perhaps lies in the possibility of a youth movement on the issue of unemployment. Mm -hmm. It's a structural situation. Mm -hmm. The situation is very bad. Mm -hmm. The government has tried to conceal every possible information. Mm -hmm. They are unable to do so. The information is out in the public domain. And one of the worst things politically, I'm just doing a political reading. There are better people in this room who can do economic reading better than I can. So I'll focus on the political part of it. There is unemployment. You can hide the GDP figures of the country. But it's very hard to make an unemployed person believe that she is employed. <laughs> you can say GDP is 11% when it's 2%. But unemployment is hard to hide from the victim. Equally importantly, unemployment is very ed educated unemployment is very hard to conceal from the media. Indian media can ignore the protest by 10,000 farmers. But if 1,000 young people, some of them possibly from IIT, stand up on Jantar Mantar with some placards written in English, <laughs> television covers it. Even today they cover it. They have to cover it. It's of the middle class, for the middle class, by the middle class. Any middle class protest has to be covered. Cannot be ignored for long. So there is unemployment. Educated unemployment is worse than normal unemployment levels. It is concentrated in urban areas. This is a potentially a very, one of the most significant areas of political resistance to this regime. Will not be on question of democracy, will not be on secularism, may actually take place on the issue of unemployment. Uh, and the challenge there is to bring four categories of unemployed Indians together. One is would-be unemployed, those who are studying in universities, are doing time pass, <laughs> are on their way, their way to being unemployment. They know they are there on their way to be unemployed. unemployed. So that's one. Second, those who are unemployed and they know it. They are usually sitting in small towns for coaching institutes, Mukherjee Nagar in Delhi, the number is astonishing. The volume of aspirants for these government jobs is something to be seen to be believed. You know, the railways advertised something recently, and for what about uh, 90,000 jobs, 1.5 crore applications came. This is the volume we are looking at. 15 million applicants for less than 100,000 jobs. So Indian small town India and metropolitan India is full of these unemployed people who describe themselves as aspirants of this or that, etc. Go to any small town India, the first holding that you find outside the railway station is that of a coaching institute, not even of mobile phones. Coaching institute is the top uh, so, second category is these aspirants, these are properly unemployed. Third category is those who are notionally employed, these contractual workers, from mm -hmm. Swiggy to everything, mm -hmm. they work on slave wages. The numbers are huge, they are extremely vulnerable, and hard to organize. And the fourth is now a category of those who are being retrenched. 
in the last six months, I again would not be able to statistically confirm it, but episodically of the last six months, now I'm getting information from one place after another, 1,000 employees retrenched here, 500 bench there, and so on and so forth. These are potential, these are most explosive potentially politically. So the job of politics is somehow bring these four groups together. That, to me, is genuine counter-hegemonic politics of today. The third is anti-corruption movement. The trouble is that uh, it is very hard to convince an ordinary Indian that any party could be more corrupt than Congress. Uh, it will take time. BJP is well on its way. Uh, it's trying hard to beat the Congress. But it, it will take time, also because of suppression of information right now, because of which uh, you know, the CAG and other things are not functioning the way they should. But that's because BJP has systematically diluted every anti-corruption institution. The anti-corruption law has been diluted. So something of that kind needs to be, uh, if that will be a uh, arena uh, where BJP will be vulnerable. It's a ground. What shape it will take, I do not know. That's your middle term strategy. In the long run, the real challenge to my mind is to take it on ideologically. It is a battle of ideas. And BJP's victory has been made possible by a massive defeat of the liberal, secular, left, progressive camp. They have been defeated. The fact that I do not even have a name for that camp, I have to stitch these, staple these things together. Liberal, left, progressive, secular, pro-constitution. This entire camp, I suspect many of us sitting in this room would belong to some hue of this camp. We have been defeated in a war of ideas. And unless we recover that, there is no real hope in the future. Let me put it as bluntly as possible. Even if BJP were to lose an election, even if, let us say, for example, Congress were to come to power, they will not pursue a policy which is substantially different from the BJP. Electoral politics is a search for the median voter. And if the median voter, if the median has been shifted, no party in electoral democracy can ignore it. You can see what Congress is doing in Madhya Pradesh elsewhere, Congress is Hinduizing itself. They will have to do so, unless you. So the spectrum needs to be shifted back. This is not going to be a short-term effort. It is going to be long-term. In all fairness, one must pay one tribute to the RSS. They worked very hard for 90 years. The liberal seculars have not even worked hard for 90 months to defend the Constitution. Honestly, who's worked there? How many pracharaks do we have to defend the Constitution of India, the Republic of India, the idea of India? We had a lovely Constitution. We thought all is done. We have the Supreme Court. Uh, we were in the Parliament. And don't forget, for the first 50 years of our Republic, anyone with RSS affiliation could not occupy a high position in academia, was debarred from media informally. So the left liberals dominated our textbooks, they dominated our educational institutions, they dominated our media, <coughs> and yet did not actually do very much to defend the idea of India. Because for every new generation, you have to put it in a new language. For every new generation, you have to resell your foundational ideas. They are not things which would come automatically. And in order to do so, there are three things that need to be done. That's somewhat controversial, so I retained it for the last. <laughs> I think the massive ideological failure that we have had is because we gifted away three of the most valuable things in the currency of politics. Number one, nationalism. Number two, religious tradition, religious heritage, <coughs> including that of Hinduism. Number three, 
cultural traditions, including our languages. These three things were surrendered by us. We have kept them in the house. And now we are saying that we were the ones who did that. So what is required is reclaiming nationalism. Indian secular progressive intellectuals started relating to India's nationalism the way European intellectuals relate to European nationalism. They do it with sense of deep embarrassment, guilt. But Indian nationalism is of a different kind. Ours is not German nationalism. This is anti-colonial nationalism with positive content. So reclaiming the legacy of nationalism is the first challenge. Second challenge is reconnecting to religious traditions. Traditions, I'm not speaking of one singular tradition. There is no one singular tradition. Even Hinduism is not one singular tradition. There are people who know infinitely more than I do on these things. These are multiple traditions we have. And these multiple traditions offer us a vocabulary to say whatever we want to say. Equality, gender equality, caste, anti-caste struggles. For everything there is a vocabulary within religious traditions. And of course there is a huge amount of nonsense in these religious traditions. <laughs> but what you do with a river? You take out the dirt and you drink the water. That's what every civilization does. That's what we need to do to religions. And three, recover our cultural, cultural heritage. Be the proud inheritor of our cultural heritage, including our languages. I often feel like doing this dirty game to Indian intellectuals. If I'm sitting in a room with 50, I want to ask, when was the last time you read any book in a language other than English? Any Indian language other than English? When was the last time you wrote an A4 sheet in any Indian language other than English? I'm afraid the answer would be very embarrassing. And that is where the problem lies. The Indian liberal elite is like the Russian elite of the 19th century, which spoke French and was occasionally scandalized by what the peasants had to say. We cannot afford to be that. We cannot be so disconnected. It is this disconnect which has created the vacuum in which anyone who puts up a tilak looks like Hindu, anyone who talks Rashtra looks like nationalist. Those who have shed not a drop of blood for India's freedom are the inheritors of the legacy of nationalism. We are responsible for that. That is a long battle of ideas that we need to get in. The battle must begin today. But we must realize it's a battle of at least 10 to 20 years before we can begin to see its rewards. How many of us are willing to do that? And the last thing, we need a new political instrument. Older political instruments have exhausted themselves. We need a new political force. We need a new energy. Now, this would look like beginning of an advertisement for Swaraj India. So I'll stop here <laughs> with an invitation for all of you to please speak to me after this. I'm not here only to give a lecture. I'm, there is, honestly, this is about saving the very idea of India. This is about saving the Republic of India. I'm giving lectures, but for me, this is not just a lecture. It is an occasion to connect to those who don't want to just say best wishes. Please don't give me best wishes join in whichever way you can. After the lecture, I'll be very happy to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this extremely inspiring, also depressing <laughs> lecture. Um, the organizers have asked me to uh, start with some comments and then throw it open to the rest of you. Uh, it's difficult to comment because I happen to agree with almost everything <laughs> that uh, Jogan has said. Um, so let me try to supplement a little bit. Um, and that, that also in a rambling way because I'll just, uh, in the short time, I'll just uh, mention uh, a small number of things, scattered things. Uh, in fact, I also agree that the, we shouldn't be in denial. I also agree that 
It's a serious moment and the pillars of Indian democracy, as he described it, are crumbling. Uh, let me mention about the uh, pillars of, um, of the Constitution, which is uh, democracy, diversity, and development, as he said. If you take democracy and di diversity, in a way, the BJP is doing something they have promised for decades. If, uh, when the Constitution was, was made in India, 26 January 1950, when we started with the Constitution, if you read the BJP newspapers and magazines of that time, the two, three years before that, Organizer is one of the major magazines. If you read the editorials and articles in this, they openly say, we do not accept this constitution. They say this constitution is Western. It's Nehru's, this, uh, this uh, Englishman Nehru's constitution, which is not our constitution. It is not consistent with Manusmriti, for example. So they, I don't think we can charge them today of not accepting. Yes, I mean, after RSS, the, the, the man whose statue, they have, created, they have this tall statue and small minds. <laughs> Ballabhai Patel, when he banned RSS, and then finally got them back, Ballabhai Patel made them promise that RSS will not enter Indian politics. So now you can imagine what Patel made them <laughs> promise and what they did with that promise. Uh, but they were, until then, they were openly saying, this is not our constitution. We don't accept this constitution. Manu is the, uh, is, is the kind of things we should go for. So in a sense, we, sh we, are, we have deluded ourselves that this idea of India that Jogan talked about, many of us have talked about, is something that's been accepted by everyone, not certainly by this group. And they are the dominant group now. Second thing that I wanted to mention is um, I'm probably slightly more skeptical about the possibility of having a movement on the basis of the unemployed. Because there are different kinds. Farmers' movement I'm more hopeful about. Even though, even with that farmers' movement, how quickly it was uh, deflated during the election time is quite a lesson to me. Because I really assume the farmers' movement would be a big thing. But unemployment movement I'm more dubious about because there are different kinds of unemployment. And Indian unemployment is not like Western unemployment. Because you are not really, if you are poor, you cannot afford to be unemployed. So you do something, you scrounge around. So the nature of unemployment is, uh, is different. But more importantly, and this is where the legitimacy of ideology is, I think, much more important. Let me give you an example. During the election time, I was intensely reading all newspaper reports, blogs, etc. Many of them reported the following incident. Many of them, not just one. So there are these reporters going around in UP, and talking to young people, and said, uh, uh, Suhari vote for Modi ji. Uh, Modi ji, in 2014, didn't he promise that he'll get jobs for you? He said, yes. Uh, do you have a job? He said, no. And you are going to vote for Modi ji? He said, yes, but Modi ji has made our nation great. <laughs> so that, to me, <laughs> tells you that unemployment is less important than this idea of something that makes you proud. In fact, uh, immediately after the, uh, after the election, I wrote a piece in the Indian Express. And I said, if 2014 was a victory of false hope, 2019 is a victory of false pride. And this pride that we are a big nation without noticing that the rest of the world, in the eyes of the rest of the world, by many criteria, we are lower now, even as a nation, our national prestige. Democracy, India, the whole world used to think, well, India has a lot of problems, but it has this democracy. We are not no longer a full democracy. In fact, many of these standard uh, ranking index of, uh, of democracy, India is called a flawed democracy, and even that, 
between 2004, for example, the Economist Intelligence Unit does a report on ranking of democracies all over the world for more than 100 countries. Um, between 2014 and 2018, that was the last time they did it, the sharp decline in the democracy index. And of course, sharp decline in many other criteria of uh, freedom of press, etc., etc. Now, on the issue of, um, I think I completely agree with Jogendra that the task is really to reclaim the legitimacy of uh, ideological legitimacy. And on that, nationalism to me is, is really very important. And in a sense, the RSS and BJP have hijacked our idea of nationalism. And making it, this would be ironically, this is like Jinnah's nationalism. So RSS is having nationality, nationalism based on religion. Of course, it's a slightly more sophisticated if you read Savarkar. Savarkar uh, does not exclude uh, Sikhs and Buddhists, but does exclude Christians and Muslims in his idea of India. Why? He says, uh, Savarkar openly says this, that Muslims and Christians, for them, India is not the Punya Bhumi, the sacred land. The sacred land is also it's better line or Mecca. So, but Buddhists and, uh, and, and Sikhs, Sikhs and Jains, they are allowed. So this is the logic, so it's not just in it. So I think if you distinguish between two major forms of nationalism, one is based on singular principle of ethnicity or religion, and the other, which I think Habermas called constitutional patriotism, based on constitutional values, which essentially is the values in our constitution, the main value is diversity, but the pillar that Jogindra talked about. Now, how do you do that? That's not very easy to do something that's been hijacked on this kind of nationalism, which appeals to people, to, to revert it back to nationalism based on constitutional values is not very easy. And that's where also I think Jogin's point about doing something about religion, our, that some of this diversity is we inside Hinduism. So I say, I often say, not me, BJP is not merely anti-national in the sense of constitutional nationalism. BJP is anti-Hindu because it violates one of the main principles of Hinduism. Because some of this diversity is inside Hindu religion. So I think it is important to emphasize they are anti-national, they are anti-Hindu. The last thing, uh, uh, just one other thing, when I think about that, this young man who's saying, oh yes, I don't have any jobs, but uh, nation, uh, Modiji is making our nation great. I think there's also, apart from ideology, there's also a matter of information. Quite often, they don't have the information. When, if you tell him, that Modiji by telling that ancient Hindus knew plastic surgery because Ganesh is, is an embodiment of plastic surgery. It's, it make, it make us a laughing stock of the world. That information is not there. That rest of the world thinks that we are a lesser democracy now. That information is not there. They think our national prestige is going up. So I think it's not just ideology, there's also a matter of information and that's where you know, what is to be done, this should be done even in the short term uh, and certainly uh, in, in medium and, and, and long term. Uh, one other issue, and then I'll, I'll give up uh, for now, uh, over two, two other issues. I think you mentioned, at the very end, you talked about language. I've been thinking for quite some time now, maybe what I, I, I'm thinking of writing an article <coughs> or, or something that I didn't believe in, but now probably I'll write it in on, in defense of regional chauvinism. This government, the Kashmir Act, is not just about the Kashmir. The larger thing, it's an assault on federalism. So it's an assault on regional decentralization. So I think it's regional chauvinism, time has come 
So I'm all with the Tamil uh, DNK <laughs> when they say, so if it's Hindi, Hindu, Hindustan, at least oppose Hindi, oppose your language, <laughs> imposition of your language in the rest of India. India is diverse linguistically. And so even though I'm very much opposed to Mamata Banerjee, when she says she wants to fight Modi with Bengali chauvinism, I'm, sort of, I'm at least <laughs> withdrawing my criticism, of, my usual criticism of Mamata. So maybe I'm surprised that these two gentlemen who rule India now are Gujaratis. I'm surprised Gujaratis are giving up on Gujarati and taking up Hindi. Same is happening in Maharashtra. Maharashtra is extremely proud of the Marathi language and culture, etc. I think what is to bring back those back, and that is consistent what what we uh, you ended up with. One last point um, on the things that not, when you say nothing can be done on the issue of elections, etc. I was just wondering at some stage if you can tell us uh, if there is anything can be done on the front of election funding or public funding of elections. Is that at all feasible? Uh, or I know there are problems of various kinds. So uh, something about not so, so much the EVMs, but funding of elections, uh, public funding of elections, something that we should discuss. So let me stop there. And I will uh, take some questions. Uh, unlike me, don't follow me. Not <laughs> comments, but questions <laughs> uh, to Jogan. Yeah, I'm sure ma many people here were thinking as you went through everything how very how almost everything you said applies to us in the United States. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 One thing that uh, uh, you just said that I don't think w applies to our situation is the people wearing the MAGA hats, they do not need information. They are oblivious to information. Maybe it's different in India. My question for you, Yogendra, is you didn't address in what is to be done, how can you have an op opposition or an alternative that is not a joke? Where do you look? That's a source of despair. And not in this country. I don't think it, I think we have a non-joke opposition going right now. The other difference I'd say, when you criticize, New York Times criticizes every day uh, Trump. Mm -hmm. It's not called anti-national. But in India, you try doing that, you are called an anti national. Yeah, yeah. I, That's a big difference. It's not so, exactly. Do you want to answer yeah. questions? You decide whichever way. Uh, I'll collect some questions. Maybe collect three questions and second question, please. Yeah, I'm curious about um, what Yuvendra Ji has to say about the role of trade unions in developing this opposition and also talking about the question of organizing farmers, um, the unemployed, and the anti corruption. Uh, my question was related to, I think, what happened uh, in the 90s, and you have written about this, about the OBC movement, deepening of democracy. So now that when we talk about lack of ideas, was that a movement that was mainly sort of practical in terms of what it was doing, or did, was there some kernel of a new idea there which slowly got lost? Maybe three questions, three or three. Uh, <coughs> A couple of things about what uh, Pranavda said. Uh, I desperately try to disagree with him. <laughs> uh, I, I think, Pranavda, we need to think of something better than co constitutional patriotism. Uh, constitutional patriotism is not an answer for us. Uh, I've been struggling with this. Uh, we need to anchor it somewhere. The anchoring in our context cannot be constitution. Uh, we are lucky to have the constitution that we have, it doesn't have still that kind of depth and root in public opinion, in public sentiment yet. When you say BJP is doing something unconstitutional, so I've been trying with something which I would, uh, I wanted to give a write up separately, which is to think of India's Swadharma. That India, there is something which is deeper than the constitution, which is in a sense the uh, moral constitution of our republic as it were, unwritten moral constitution of our republic. And that is Swadharma. 
what is the swadharma of India? And that what is happening today is the violation of that swadharma. I think that's uh, something I wanted to explore, uh, but can present only if I've worked on it. Uh, my sense on the language is that BJP will actually not try to impose Hindi. They are clever than that. <laughs> uh, they will not. They will bypass it. Hinduism, yes. Authority of central government and crushing of federalism, yes. Hindi language, they will try and keep. If you, just, just to give you an instance, uh, recently the national education policy was announced, which actually did not actually announce anything new for Hindi. It merely reiterated the old, tired formula of 50 years of three language formula. Somehow someone picked up one line and said, Hindi imposition. The important thing is not the reporting. The important thing is BJP's reaction. Within 24 hours, they stepped back, and in a typical BJP style, they asked the author of the report to change the report within 24 hours <laughs> without consulting members of the report writing team. <laughs> you know, this is what happened. So I don't think they'll touch language issue. They're clever than that. Uh, public funding of elections, uh, yes, of course, something can be done about it. I do not ever expect it from the BJP. Uh, as long as the BJP is uh, The trouble with public funding, I mean, I've supported that idea. I think it's a great idea. I've written the what modalities it can take place. It, will, it will, should be through cash reimbursement on vote share basis. Uh, but why would the beneficiaries of the existing system ever dislodge themselves? And having brought in that electoral bonds, which is the biggest leap backwards in our democracy, uh, why would a party wish to do that? So in that sense, I don't think anything will be done about it. Of course, it should be done. Uh, trade unions' role, I wish I could be optimistic. Uh, the fact is that labor rights are being violated like never before in the last few years. States are competing with each other to ensure, come invest in my state. I will ensure there is no labor trouble. Haryana is leading state in that. Traditional trade unions have simply failed uh, for various reasons, some of which I understand, some of which I don't. But traditional trade unions are no longer effective. Uh, we need a new kind of trade union movement, which is primarily focused on the contract labor and the unorganized labor. Trade unions of the organized labor have stopped being, I mean, I almost feel they're not even progressive anymore. And some of the things they do, including trade unions of the teachers, which I have been a part of, these, these, these are not progressive in any sense of the term anymore. Uh, but something, on the, if, if someone can come with the innovative model for contract labor, that is where the real exploitation is. That is where the real energy is. And the numbers now are huge. Uh, on my writings on deepening of democracy in the 1990s, that's one more article someone may have read and decided to disprove. <laughs> so uh, I, I think that simply doesn't stand anymore. I used to write, even in those days, that uh, one should not read too much into these movements because uh, ideologically they did not represent any alternative. And uh, as we saw, uh, that's something that we had written later in 2009, I think Suhas and I wrote, to say how the third democratic upsurge has exhausted itself. So it is no longer, in that sense, a progressive upsurge. And the regional parties today, they are actually some of them in your, we can be angry with BJP, but we should also be very disappointed with these so-called regional parties. Because they do not inter defend the interest of the regions. I mean, forget everything else. They vote with BJ Akali, they vote with BJP on Kashmir. ADMK votes with BJP. BJD votes with BJP on abolishing a state overnight. So I think there's a, there's a complete ideological bankruptcy. And these movements actually uh, don't represent uh, a certain healthy regionalism is constitutive of India. Uh, so I completely go with uh, what uh, Professor Bardhan was saying in defense of regionalism. Uh, but they don't defend, re they, are, they don't stand for regionalism. These are caste-based family properties. Uh, no more. Uh, 
how can we have an opposition which is not a joke? Uh, two things. Uh, we need new kind of party. We need a new party, but we need a new kind of politics. One word about both. I really think that these existing big political parties have exhausted themselves. The drama that is still playing out in Congress party for the last two weeks uh, may have actually given a meaning to what I said, which I did not intend at that point. When I said Congress must die, this was more to say if you cannot take on the BJP in this election, you better die. But they also probably take, took it very seriously. <laughs> so they're actually trying to do <laughs> which I, I, I never said, said they are going to die, but what Congress is doing currently. So I, I think, but what we don't notice is that most other opposition parties are no different. Congress happens to be in spotlight. Hap its, its weaknesses happen to be in public. What's happening in BSP? Does anyone know what's happening in BSP? What's happening to Samajwadi Party right now? What's happening in Haryana? The entire opposition leaders are in a queue to be admitted to the BJP. And BJP decide who not to admit. That's currently the politics of Haryana. So this is the entire opposition. We need a new. This is just this vacuum is also a historic opportunity to create something new. But that something new must not be merely a new political party. I think we need to think of a new kind of political party. I have argued elsewhere that politics is a, uh, is, is a panchang karma yoga. It's a karma yoga which has five elements in it. One is satta yoga, elections, contestations, and so on. Second is kranti yoga, struggles. Third is sahyog, constructive work. Fourth is Gyan Yoga, because universities, at least in India, have nothing to do with knowledge anymore. <laughs> so creation of knowledge. And the fifth is Dhyan Yoga, connecting with the inner self. These are five essential elements of politics. Currently, unfortunately, we have divided this into five different agencies. Political parties do Satta Yoga and become machines. Movements do struggle and therefore become one-dimensional. NGOs do constructive work and become a shop looking for the next grant. Universities are too busy with examination and degrees, don't have time for knowledge. And uh, these babas are looking after your inner health <laughs> without looking at their own. Uh, all these five need to be brought. All these are five dimensions of politics. So we need a new political party but we need a new kind of political party, which is a bit of a party, a bit of an NGO, a bit of an ashram. Mm -hmm. um, why don't you stand there? You can take only, because we only have five more minutes. So two questions, maybe. You decide. No, no, you no, do no, the cruel decide. job of deciding <laughs> who is not being. <laughs> Just finish this round. Yeah, this. Uh, OK, we can. OK, just, yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you for your, thank you for both of your uh, I agree with all the midterm strategies or ideas that you're trying to talk about. But what I don't agree or where I feel a concern is if the same things even go successfully, they will even go only go successful for one particular religion, in this case Hindu. So I think the bigger problem or bigger concern which is happening right now since the current government has the power and know how to use the power, that they will only address un unemployment farmers if they do only for one particular you said it's easy to remove pressure from religion and use the good parts about it, but I think religion in its way just stands in, a, in our way to just do anything interestingly or creatively or peacefully. I totally agree with you when you said try to love those who love Modi, and that's the only thing actually I know that I can do right now. And if you have any other suggestions, I'll be happy to hear. But I can only love those people who love Modi who are atheists. Someone is very particular about the religion. Okay. I, I, I think we'll be trying at times, including my own family also. <laughs> yes. Um, 
Can you know what, as well, where do you see the trajectory of uh, Dalit Bahujan Adivasi space for organization and also an opportunity in the political sphere and also other spaces perhaps to not just for the others to pretend to either represent them or speak for them, for them to speak as well and make the difference? Maybe there. Yes, please. Um, you spoke about uh, democracy and diversity, but I want to invite you to speak a little bit more about development. I thought he was to answer those questions. <laughs> <laughs> the, the reason being that when the BGP first came to power, one of the things they talked about was uh, taking a so-called advantage of India, so-called de demographic dividend, <laughs> which meant a massive, not just a massive investment in infrastructure and education, but also an accelerated growth model, which has been largely dominant in India for several decades. And my question is, in, in, in order to think about a sort of counter-hegemony, how to think about an alternative model of development also, because that's one, development has become now in some ways the kind of the aspirational model for a vast you know, population right? uh, that is buying cell phones and, and, so, and so forth. But it's also going to collide with the realities of not just uh, in Indian, you know, the finitude of, of Indian natural resources, but on a global level. Right? And that's happening much more rapidly than we realize. So I just wanted to ask you if you've been thinking more about, uh, as part of the counter-hegemonic strategy, you've mentioned the different things, language, uh, and, uh, culture, and so forth, whether an alternative model of development is also something you've been thinking about. Um, so uh, last question, because I, I don't think I'll be able to answer all yeah, My yes. question is that the present elevated stature of BJP, RSS, Kamla, whatever, how much of it is really a new construct made by them, and how much of it is really a reflection of the inherent sentiments of the people that were already there. Uh, they were all, always, you know, anti-Muslim, anti-Pakistan, this, that. My, just as an analogy, I like to think, that anti-Semitism always existed in Germany and Eastern Europe, and Hitler really fanned it up, rather than Hitler created it. How much of that was really the case? I'd like to hear your question as well. Yeah, huh? next to you. Yeah. The next to you. So I, I'll just ask you. One more time, when you said that uh, Afrofi um, reclaimed the uh, traditions, so did you mean the Hinduization that Congress is kind of trying to do? Um, or did you just mean the liberals and uh, try to be more taking the like uh, religion, religious tradition and not uh, let them appropriate? And uh, so if you could clarify how to do those things and what you mean. And uh, so one more, the second was like media, how do we fi fight uh, the, that challenge? So, so we write on social media, all of us, that there are um, uh, portals like Wire and all, nobody reads them. Mm -hmm. So the main culprits are the, the television channels. Mm -hmm. Some of them are pure, like I call them terrorists, like Republic, which are like in, in instigating, and the other are pure propaganda. So how do we find that? Unless we find that, how do we do, uh, how do we fight this battle? And lastly, how long do you think it should take to? <laughs> <laughs> how long? How long? Uh, was uh, anti-Muslim, anti-Pakistan fusion of these sentiment inherent in our population? Yes, of course, we've been through partition. It would be surprising if it were not to be there. Uh, did the BJP merely bring it up? No, I would say it's much more than that. Such sentiments, a certain healthy disrespect for each other, is there in most societies, most of the time, on most communities. Prejudices, stereotypes about each other are prevalent all over the world. We had a little more than that. There was a potential, yes. But was that potential only waiting to be realized? No. If it had happened in 1950s, I would have said, well, it was bound to happen. But for it to happen in 2010, there's no reason in history for this to happen. This is a classic case of political agency. Politics makes things happen where there was no inevitability about it. On farmers and unemployment, uh, the government would do it in such a way that benefits only Hindus. I do not know of any way any government can do something about unemployment and farmers. 
that would benefit only Hindu farmers, only Hindu unemployed. That's not possible, and that's precisely why we need categories of this kind. Uh, in fact, uh, as they say in Hindi, "Choti line ko mitane ki bajaye, badi line aap uh, The way to counter this Hindu-Muslim mobilization is to think of categories that crisscross. And that's why this is such an important counter-hegemonic strategy. Uh, on the Dalit Bahujan space, I think it's time for reinvention of Dalit Bahujan politics. The first generation of Dalit politics, uh, which in a sense began with Kashi Ramji, second generation, let's say, after Ambedkar, that has exhausted itself. The pathetic state of the BSP and that of SP and RJT is a testimony to a complete exhaustion. It's waiting for a next generation now. What that next generation could be like and what it would be like, we can discuss. But it has, it, this old style politics of Bahujans cannot work anymore. BJP gets more votes among Dalits and Bahujan today than any other party. Uh, on uh, development, yes, I, you're absolutely right. Uh, this has to be thinking about, uh, alternative politics has to be thinking about alternative models of development as well, uh, because we cannot simply replicate. Uh, I think, and also we need to, I mean, I think how, a lot about it. The trouble is the lim inherent limitations of uh, me and of the discipline that uh, economists have created. It is more ideologized discipline than anything on earth. <laughs> Economics is more ideologized than political science. Uh, and it's hard to get elementary facts uh, from this discipline. Uh, so how do we think to, I mean, I, I keep thinking, how do we think in a creative way to recognize that markets are here to stay and state regulation is here to stay? So can we do away with fantasies of both kinds <laughs> and actually live on the reality that limits to growth are given, but an economy like India needs to grow. B growth is not a model for us. It is a model for many of the countries, including where we are standing. B growth is lovely, but India needs growth in a conventional sense as well. Our poverty requires that we need do something about it. How do we bring it together is something I really don't know. I floated a term, and I was hoping that some economists would catch it. I said what we need is economics. <laughs> Eco for ecology, norm for ethics, X for its rational, rational choice games and the smartness of economic models. We need to bring the three together. I'm not educated enough to find where, I'm sure someone would have done it. Please point me in that direction. Uh, finally, religion comes in the way. Anyone but someone who is religious. I think Ashish Nandi had a beautiful article. The opening line is, there are superstitions, and there are superstitions about superstitions. <laughs> I think we need to take that very seriously. Religion is a label under which all kinds of things take place. So to say religion leads to oppression is correct. But to say religion only leads to oppression and only religion leads to oppression is wrong. It is like Paul Potts doing being blamed on Karl Marx. So for me, religion is a label under which Marxism is a label. Science is a label. Under science, a lot of genocide takes place. But science is not genocidal. <laughs> Marxism led to elimination of millions. But Marxism is not about that. Hinduism has led to enormous oppressive practices. But that's not all that there is to Hinduism. So I would do to Hinduism what I would do to Marxism, what I would do to science, what I would do to nationalism. Namely, Sar Sar ko gahe totha de since Linda is here, I thought I must quote Kabir <laughs> and say, that's what you need to do. Pick what is relevant, just throw away discard. And that's a very traditional activity. Mm -hmm. To critique religion, to oppose religious establishment, is a very traditional activity, which has happened for centuries. There's nothing new. Let's follow the tradition in debunking religions of certain kind and picking what needs to be done. 
I do not want to surrender Basavanna simply because he happens to be under some religion. Uh, his, uh, I don't want to surrender Kabir. So that's the thing. Uh, on the how do we, which relates to how do we reclaim traditions, uh, I must say something uh, which is probably uncomfortable for some. But I must honestly say, because I'm uncomfortable with it for years now, I think in a certain kind of academic intellectual world, it became acceptable, almost fashionable, to ridicule Hinduism. Uh, and as good seculars, we were somewhat careful about minority religions. We would say those ritual things about Islam is about equality without knowing anything about Islam. <laughs> we would utter these two sentences which were mild and nice. <laughs> but giving Hinduism a hard kick was the order of the day. I think that may have been very counterproductive. It's time to think hard, take every religious tradition carefully, understand it deeply, critique it deeply with some knowledge, I'm afraid what we, have, what we have promoted in India is an educated illiteracy about traditions. Mm -hmm. An educated Indian cannot distinguish Puranas from Upanishads. Mm -hmm. They think they are both the same kinds. Mm -hmm. I find educated uh, Muslims who cannot tell you a thing about Hadith. They don't know what is it. So we have promoted illiteracy in a way in which Europe never promoted illiteracy about its own religions and traditions. Mm -hmm. you know, we have promoted educated, especially English educated idiots <laughs> that <laughs> must stop. We must realize it. You know, these are hard times and hard times are times when we must learn some hard lessons. This thing must stop. What is so great about European tradition European socialism, in many ways, is drawn straight from Christianity. European socialism is one variant of Christianity. In Latin America, they could do liberation theology. Why can't we relate to our traditions and come up with something beautiful? There's so much resource. We have not used it. That has created that vacuum in which anyone does it. Tilak picks up a trishul. Bharat Mata Ki Jai, Jai Shri Ram, he is Hindu, you are nowhere. That giving up on your cultural belonging and sense of self-respect has actually caused the vacuum in which Mr. Modi has walked in. We are responsible for creation of that vacuum. These are hard things. I did want to say it honestly. How long will it take? <laughs> I don't know. If my father is ill, if I am sitting beside him, I am giving him medicines. If someone says, how long will you keep treating him? As long as I can. As long as he is around, as long as I am around. If it's a question about someone on a railway platform who I do not know, you can ask the question, how long will you keep sitting? How long will you treat this patient? When will you go back home? But if it is your home, your father, your child, your son, your wife, your daughter, then this is an irrelevant question. Saving India has no timelines. Professor Yadav, thank you again so much. This is something very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much.